Okay, so this piece here is going to be this hydraulic cylinder here. And it runs right through the platform like this. And what I've done is, is I've taken... Um, what do I got here? I got 7 30 seconds, 9 30 second tube, and 80 thou rod, and 5 30 seconds. So there's 5 30 second, 7 30 second, 9 30 second, and 80 thou rod. All four of these, well, one rod and three tubes, basically works out to be what I'm after and I can telescope these or treat them telescopically All right and then the rod fits in which will be the hydraulic rod okay and then these will go through the platform like this now there's a big thick plate that they sit on, so I need to cut 80 thou. All right, so I'm gonna cut a few, well actually it's 160, I'm gonna double these up. So in order to drill through this kind of plastic and get a, get a clean hole, you need to sandwich it between two pieces of wood, at least that's the way I've always done it. And then I'm just gonna drill a whole bunch, an inch or so apart, I got lots of this scrap around, and then I'll just draft up the hexagon. It's a hexagon actually that goes around the hole. It's just easier to, to, to just drill all the holes in the plate and then draft around the hole in my experience if you're doing just a one-off like this. It's different if you're going to do multiple multiple plates let's say but uh, that's what I'll do. I'll just drill drill through like this and then uh, you'll get a nice clean hole through your uh, Styrene, okay. Okay, so here's my plate, just a bunch of holes I drilled in there, it doesn't matter. You can drill them all over this plate if I want to, it's a piece of scrap. Uh, the drill was just a tiny bit too large for my liking, but I'm not going to run to the store and buy another drill bit just for this. It'll, I'll just get distracted and I'll have to write the day off, so, and I'm not going to do that. I want to keep my momentum going. So I'm that's easily fixed with a tiny piece of 10 thou strip or doubt it, it doesn't matter like you won't even see it and then there's 45s in here so and then there's an octagon shape and what i'll do is i'll just draft draft up a template an octagon template and then i'll just line it up and trace it on all these other ones and then laminate them together and i'll have my piece that i'll show you later on <clears throat> Okay, so I just want to show you this, uh, you know, sort of building up the uh, hydraulic cylinder and uh, rod. But uh, let me just share something with you that my dad said to me when I was, uh, I guess it was about 40 years ago now, or maybe 35 years ago. I was, I think I was working in the aviation industry then, uh, out at YVR in Vancouver, BC, and I was going through a bit of a tough time. And my dad and I were out for a walk one day, and he just said to me, 
you know, just fail forward some. And it was like, boom, you know, this light bulb turned on, you know, because it had some heavy hits and, uh, you know, and I was sort of struggling a bit. And I, and when he said that, man, it was like, wow, you know, fail forward. Like, you know, get back up, you know, when you get knocked down, just get back up and, and, and push harder. And, uh, you know, just take a new approach, you know. And boy, was he ever right, you know. And I respect him too, you know. Like he, like he grew up in Lashburn, Saskatchewan, you know, 40 below weather. He was sent to an orphanage. You know, came from a big family of seven kids and the parent, you know, his dad couldn't support him. And, you know, he moved away anyway. And my, his mother lived in a one room shack. You know, I'm not kidding you. And, uh, you know, so he went, ended up in an orphanage. He had a tough life, you know, and uh, he's a good guy. You know, he's a good guy. He's always been an encouragement to me. And, you know, uh, he doesn't have to say much. You know, he's 87, but when he does, boy, do I ever listen. So, you know, uh, I think the same thing approaches or the same thing applies, I should say, to almost anything in life, including model building. You know, just fail forward. Like, I make mistakes all the time. You know, I have piles of stuff that I mess up. And, you know, I mean, I could watch 100 videos and read 10 books and figure I got it all in my head and then still sit apprehensive and not commit right like you gotta do the things you fear to do and the fear will disappear you know you you just attack like attack the project just like just go for it like i model challenges like this like scare me all the time sometimes i just say you know i'm just going to give it a shot you know, i'm going to try it anyway and if i mess up i'll i'll fix it or i'll just move on you know it's like that's just the way it is you know this this idea that people that are gifted or, or experienced modelers don't have problems well you're wrong because the problems never end like life is tough it was meant to be tough and so we all like we're all in it together and we all got to overcome right you got to be an overcomer in life and uh, the rewards are are like that's where the silver lining is is in overcoming anyway so uh this uh hydraulic cylinder is really cool and i just figured this out from studying the photographs right like right here, I'll show you. This is kind of the fun part again. Like this whole build has been fun. So you can see that, um, you know, the cabinets on on both towers, right? Like it sits on this platform here. Like this one's from the other side. But this hydraulic cylinder like goes in here like this, right? And it's mounted on this really heavy kind of uh, plate system on the deck there. And then this hydraulic rod goes up and down and at the bottom of this rod okay see that at the bottom of this rod right here there's a big heavy cast clevis I can see from one of my other photographs it's not super clear but I can interpret it as such and then there's a I think it's a dual I-beam it looks like there's two I-beams running under the front of the ramp so when they want to adjust to the barge and the tide, you know, coupled together, like the end of this ramp here, up and down. Well, this hydraulic system just goes up and down and then lifts the front of the ramp. And it's controlled, I think, from this box right here, because this is the only, like, there's, like, this is identical on both sides. There's another platform like this on the other side, but it doesn't have a kiosk built onto it with a roof. So I imagine this is where the, you know, the boxes where the switches and relays are or whatever. And then in here, there's some really heavy hoses and I can see some heavy fittings. So this must, this is a big stainless box here on both sides. And it must be full of, you know, valves and, you know, or whatever. I'm not super familiar with, you know, how hydraulic systems, but, you know, in a cat or a big backhoe or something, right? They got a... a an enclosure with all that stuff going on too, I guess. So isn't that cool? So yeah, so these are, uh, I think, did I mention this already? Like these are, you know, different sizes of tubes and they're telescoping. Like you'll find that with evergreen plastic, like all their tubes, like there'll always be categories of them that telescope together. So I've got three pieces in there. I'll clean that up and then cap that. And then this is a one eighth rod or no, 80 thou rod running through there.
So this is how I get a really good lamination because in this case I want to laminate two pieces of 80 thou together. See there's a bit of overrun but it's okay I'm going to square all that up to the size that I want. Just, okay. So I take the, these two pieces like this and I just take the side I want to laminate and just give it a good rub like that. Put it in there like so. Give this one a good rub. And then I'll put a nice flood of solvent on here. Somebody mentioned about using a syringe. Yeah, there's that for application too, but I've always used a brush. I don't care about it. I mean, the syringe looks cool for getting into tight spots. I imagine it would be. And that's cool if you want to use that too. That's another good method. But I'm pretty content with the brush. And then I just drop that on there like that. I just love this little engineering square hole. Oh, this thing is so multi-purpose in so many ways. You know, when I want to square things up. Basically, if you get some mushrooming out the side, then you know you got a good weld. When it sort of mushrooms out of the edge like that. So when those are dry, then I'll just uh, clean them up with my board sander, right? The usual way. Get them nice and square. Okay, so you want to square up the end of a tube, right? Like how do you get it square? When you, if you just do a rough off cut on it or something. Just throw it onto your little jig like this. Grab your sanding stick. Rotate it a few times. Okay, so I just want to touch on this little method for cutting out rings. I, I don't think I covered it as well as I should have in earlier content. But So I just set up a bit of a backstop here with this tube. And I want to cut a bunch of these, right? And these can be tricky to keep square when you cut them. You know, they can wander all over the place and, you know, and then end up being a frustration. So uh, what I do is I just set up a little pencil jig like this. Like, generally, I'll just use my hand as I've done it so many times. Like, I'll just put it up against the backstop there and a little bit longer piece that's easier to handle but I want to use this up and I'll just turn it like that okay and then just do a whole bunch of lines which I've already done and then what I'll do is is I'll take this it's a finer saw like this one's had better days it's almost done really I've had it for to 20 years but I'm gonna get another one really fine one which is good and then what I do is is I, I just set it up against this little backstop here and then what I want to do is just pull a little bit on the line and then rotate it a bit and just chase that line a bit like I say once you get into it right you'll get pretty good at it after a while especially when no one's looking <laughs> and uh, Just put a good score in along the line so that when you do begin to cut through, it'll come off fairly square, see? That one didn't, see? But I got all these, so these ones came out pretty good. So, and then I just give it a rub like this. Like I say, it's getting into it and getting a feel. A lot of time, this, a lot of this goes by feel. Like part of the art of scratch building is just doing things, you know, over and over again, and you just get a feel for them. And before you know it, you know, you're really moving along. Okay, so then that's how I get those like that, see? Ring, and then, like I say, I can start adding them onto, like this pole here has a few 
and then there's a couple on this one. There's a couple of rings there that I need to touch up a bit. Cut lots, and there's one that's a retainer ring that sits there like that. Then there's a spacer underneath. Okay, remember how I talked about how to cap the end with the tube? You know, for capping the ends like this, it's just a standard for everything, right? You take your tube and a piece of scrap, in this case 20 thou, put a blob of solvent on there and just push down. And then once it's dry, you just cut off the corners and then you just get down to like this kind of look, right? And then all I do is I get it on the edge of the board here and I just turn it and nibble. Just nibble it all the way. Then you don't have to sand as much. And once you get into a groove, it just goes really fast. And then just stroke it down. Okay, so here's another little method for dealing with small parts like this, right? Like how to get them square and to clean up these edges. You know, I laminated, you know, it's easier to cut two. 80,000 sheets then gluing them together and cutting, right? So you glue them up and then I just laminated them together a bit proud, remember? A little bit larger than what's required because this is going to be a, a uh, octagon. Like it'll be eight-sided when it's finished. So just on the little jig here, so you remember these little short sticks too that I talked about? You know, when you make them different sizes, they, you know, they come in handy in ways that you don't realize until you get into the zone. So this, I'm going to just use this to hold that like in place. And then I'm going to line this up like this, and I'm just going to square this up. deal with small parts like this. Okay, so I just want to show you how I cut a hole through very thin material, like in this case, I think this is only 20 thou. In hindsight, I probably should have made this top plate out of 40 thou. Because it's, I mean, it's not as stable as I would like. You know, I'd like to be more stiffer because it's a platform that I'm building on a little bit. I mean, I can reinforce underneath here later with a little piece of I-beam or something. But we'll see how it goes because once I get the other stuff mounted on, 
like this here hydraulic sleeve and then the, if there's some braces on there it might might be okay so what I do is, is I just compass the diameter just slightly inside of this or around the same and then I just drill holes this is how I rem remove uh, material like this all right on each corner or each line and then I drill out in between like this and then all you do is just take a small number 11 blade for example and you just gently cut through to the next hole like that and go all the way around There we go, and then with a very sharp blade, I just clean it out. You can use a small tube with a bit of sandpaper around it as well if you'd like. Uh, I just tend to knife things in, and uh, I get close enough. You can see there's two circles there. I take it down to the first one. And then when I insert this sandpaper like when you get it into the hole make sure you turn it so the sandpaper wants to unravel I don't go with the wrap quote roll I don't go with the roll I mean you can sort of but if you go against the roll it'll grab sometimes just work it back and forth and then once it the more you go against the roll it's going to expand outward right and what happens is, is you just like you get a perfect hole it's a perfect hole there's no, you can't see any light through it. Okay, so I just want to point out something about the detail on uh, on the top of this hydraulic cylinder and ram, you know, that sits on the top deck like this. I mean, some of these details, I mean, I don't know all the specs for these, so whether they're undersized or oversized really doesn't matter to me. Uh, as long as they have a good, solid impression of what's going on there. I would say that these are probably a little bit oversized than the prototype. Um, if I look at this drawing here, you know, it's this big, thick plate here and then there's another thin plate on top which I just added right here see so this is uh, an area that I don't get overly stressed about 
uh, you know, like some people talk about rivet counting. Well, that might fall under that. Well, you didn't get this right. And you didn't add this little bolt here and this little return flange on this car. Like, I don't get hung up on those kind of things. Because at the end of the day, the model looks good to me. And it's a close approximation of the prototype. And that's what I'm after. However, this photo, remember how I mentioned about raw images? Like, I shot this photograph 100 yards away. So I can really crop in here and pick up all this detail. In fact, I have a closer one. I can see there's these sort of sprung rods here too. This cylinder somehow sits on here and it's, it's got a shock absorber kind of system on it. It's, it's, it's fairly sophisticated uh, hydraulic ram. And then furthermore, um, see this big sleeve cylinder here? I noticed on here, I thought it was a, just a rod, but it looks like it's an actual uh, piece of a flange or a plate with a hole drilled on the top. They would have used that, I guess, with the crane to lower it down into place or to pull it, right? Aha! So that, uh, which I've, only, I've drilled a hole for, see? That I'll probably change and then drill a small hole in it, because that's a nice little detail. And then, look at, there's, a, there's a, a hose coming down the back side of it here. This is the back, well, I guess the back side in terms of facing the, the ramp. And then there's a bunch of gack greebles, whatever you want to call them, going on back here, which I'm just going to simulate with a little relay box and some hoses. And then, uh, yeah, just capture the, you know, the impression of this, which is important. And furthermore, the hand railings here I noticed too. Like, notice how they're square here? And then they transition into round poles. So, I haven't decided yet what I'm going to do with the railings, although I've been doing some fiddling about. But I think I... I was going to use a prefab ladder, but I don't know. This ladder is unusually wide, but we'll see when I get there because I'm going to do the handrails last. Okay, so I just want to show you something where i got to make a change. Go. So I cut these flanges out. They go like this. Okay. Four of them, you know, on each corner like that. Anyway, they're a bit too big. Like I was going to cut them down. You know, you can see the line here do another cut and I thought ah you know like I made them out of this wider material this is just evergreen strip uh, so I decided I would just redraft onto a thinner strip and then uh, that way they're more square and just you know it's easier I think and then I'll just put those on and that those will look better You know, somebody mentioned in one of the comments uh, episode or two back, and it was a really great question. And they asked me, how come you don't use a syringe for your uh, glue application? You know, that some people have a little syringe because it's very thin, right? And, you know, there's some advantages to it. It, it, it stays sealed in the syringe, um, you know, because there's always the case of evaporation. But I'll show you why I like to use this method right here. Okay, so when I'm doing a lot of little parts like this, like I'm holding the model in this hand, so I can just grab this brush like this with the same hand, and I just give it a stab of glue like that. Put the cap back on. And bang, you know, the piece is in place, right? Uh, if I have to lay this down and then use a syringe and then tweezers together, I find that very cumbersome. Uh, you know that's great you know for those that like to do that but that's not my style and it's not the way I've been doing things so I'm not going to change now and if you just drop the cap on there I mean usually the you know the, the liner sits there see the white liner and uh, evaporation is to a minimal and I can work much quicker you know going like this than trying to set it up and you know lay it down and do this. I mean, that's fine, right? But that's just not my method, that's all. Okay? Okay, so I want to show you how I make these coil spring rods. Okay, like in this photo here. See here on this stand that I'm building, there's four. One, two, three, four. One on the other side. So four on each post or tower. And it sort of has a coil spring all the way around this rod. And it's some kind of a shock absorber system for the torque that these things must be under when they lift the ramp, you know. Anyway, so I just want to simulate that. The, the exact size doesn't matter. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use, first of all, number 220 
35 thou rod by Evergreen Plastics, okay? And then I'm going to uh, use a tube, a brass tube to insert it into, and I'll show you why. In this case, it's KNS Engineering 332nd ID inside diameter or uh, 14 thou. And it doesn't really matter, like as long as it just fits like that, this rod fits in there, kind of loose like that. Okay, I'll show you the reason in a second. That's just this KNS stuff. It's every hobby shop should have this. Every hobby, every hobby shop there is, especially model railroad shops, should have this. If they don't, then uh, they're not with the game. Okay, so you can get this there. Um, I've yet to see a hobby shop. Well, there's been a few, but in my past, but uh, that have this material that you can match and play around with, and and you'll be going back and forth lots. I mean, I have a lot of this. I'll just say right now because I'm a model builder or was by trade for a while that I I have everything, you know, a little bit of everything, you know. But that's just been accumulated over years, right? And then I have to replenish it now and again. So anyway, what I do is I slide that tube in there, make sure it fits in there, and then I take some of this wire. And in this case, I just picked this up for cheap at Michaels. It's just this craft wire, 28 gauge wire. It's all colored like for bead work and stuff. Michael's Craft Store has excellent resources for the modeler, especially the scratch builder. So I just took the black roll right here. And then what I do is I just tie a normal granny knot on the end of the plastic rod there and put some CA on there, some medium CA, just to anchor it on there, okay? And then what I'm going to do is, once I get it started, I just slip it in here because I'm going to hold it, hold this rod, and I want to turn this with my hand to roll this wire on, but I don't want to have it turning in my fingers here. I just want it to rotate nicely in this brass rod, just so there's less friction, okay? And then I'm going to take this here, and I'm just going to slip it over this dowel, okay? Like that, just to add a little bit of tension, okay? Uh, sometimes people want to wind it like that, you know, like it depends up to you, like how you want to set it up. And then also I'm going to do is, is I'm going to take this now and I'm just going to turn it with my left hand and I'm just going to wind this wire as I'm pulling it out of the tube. I'm going to wind this wire all the way up this rod. And I'm not going to glue this now because I'll tell you why. Like you don't have to glue it right away because you're going to cut them to lengths, right? And then you might want to maybe um, tighten up the coil a bit, you know, on each end to expose a little bit if you had a threaded area or a nut going over or, or an area to glue from, let's say. So that's just the right tension there, see? Just with a simple clamp on your little cutting jig. Remember how I mentioned about having, you know, the ability to put a clamp on and make this universal? I build every model. Like, you wouldn't believe how many models I've built on a little table jig like this. So I just wind it on like that. I'm going to probably, well, I think I'm going to cover this whole rod, right? Because I want extra. Okay, so now that I've wrapped this whole length of 35 thou, I've got plenty of material to make eight uh, sprung coiled rods or whatever. Uh, and as you can see, it's all wrapped on there. It's not glued, right? So if you want to cinch it down, just grab the end of it and slide it down in your fingernail like that, see? You can tighten them up. You can just keep sliding it down as far as you want. Just work it gently. And it just starts to tighten up. And then if you want to make a, just a regular spring, you can just slide it right off. Like that, see? A little spring coming out of the old rotted seat in the 32 Ford Roadster, right? <laughs> anyway, you got the idea. And you can make these in any size, diameter, or scale. Okay, so I just want to talk to you about uh, HO scale ladders. You know, uh, a ladder can make or break a model. You know, depending what the model is, like um, these Plastruck ladders, you know, they're okay. Like they call them 
HO scale one one hundredth ladder. So they're sort of a universal uh, ladder. I find them to be kind of fat though for HO. Uh, I know that sounds picky, but I mean these would apply because ladders vary, right? And and styles and so on. So they're totally doable, and uh, they're you know they're fine for most models. But in the case of uh, this, well, both these towers, I just want to show you something here, and I have a photograph, so let me just bring this up here. So here's the ladder right here, see there? So this is not a sort of traditional ladder like this here. Okay. This is fairly wide ladder. You can see the rungs there, like they're fairly thin iron, probably, or some form of steel. And so I decided to go to the trouble by, like I wasn't going to do it, but I thought, you know, I'll give it a try. I'll just see what kind of zone or mood I'm in. So I grabbed some uh, number 142 and 218, 20 thou rod and 40 by 40 thou uh, strips or, or square. And I decided to mark them up and then to drill them out. Uh, so I made four rails and I drilled them out with 20 thou drill bit. I know it seems crazy, but hey, it's... You know, for me, it's part of the fun. Well, you know, the challenge first. You know, of course, I don't mind doing it. But um, so I figured, well, if I can drill these out successfully, then I'll go for it. And it turns out that I did. But I'll have to say that this drill here was like brand new from God hand here, like very sharp. So it's very important that you have a sharp drill bit uh, when you do this. Otherwise, you'll end up blowing out the material or it presses it out like these drill bits they just slice right through with, with practically just the weight of the mandrel, you know. Anyway, so this is the ladder that I'm going to use. And it's, I think, more appropriate to all the work I'm putting in on the tower since they're kind of features on the actual barge slip itself. Um, these are all dry run in, like they're not glued yet. You know, but they fit quite snug. So when I run all the rungs in, and then I can build the, uh, see this, these rails go all the way up and they curl over onto the railing. So that's how I want to do it. You know what I mean? So I'm going to skip on these because they just don't look right uh, to me. And um, I'm going to go with this. Anyway, I just want to show you how I jigged up this ladder, you know. It, anything is a jig that you can rig to assist you when you assemble a model. Uh, this piece of rail that I've had for many years, I use it for all the time for a weight like this. And it's jacked up on my little bench with some of my sanding sticks at the back there. And I got metal rulers underneath pinching the other rail of the ladder. And I got a spacer in there, then this metal ruler, and then I just push. Like it's all glued on that end, so I just push in this rail tight to this ruler, and then I get my ladder totally square and straight.
So I just want to touch on the making these handrails again. So I've just marked every half inch because that's what I determined will be the spacing of the rod for the uprights or stanchions. And uh, I just use a ruler like this tape to the board just to hold it against, all right, so that I can keep it square and it won't slide or move. And then I just take this drill, which is around 20 thou, which is one of these drills here. I don't normally pay attention, you know, to the numbers. I just eyeball the drill bit, try a test piece first, and then slide the rod in and see if it fits. You don't need to do any math, really. And then you can see where they're marked there. And then I just, I position myself, probably more convenient than this here with the camera. And I just hold it upright and just let the weight of my hand, I don't push down, I just twist the drill like that, see? And run it through and there you go so I make one strip like this which will give me plenty of railings for the two towers I'll cut it just cut an upper and lower and cut it proud again and then they'll be nipped off at the end when it's squared up you know when I lay it on I'll just leave a little bit of overrun on each side because I'll glue the corners together. Okay. Okay, so I just want to talk to you about the hand railings that I'm going to put on these towers. So I want them to be a little bit more robust than the ladder. Although, you know, this ladder, since it's like prototypically uh, much wider than the standard ladder, as I mentioned earlier, you could use this for railings as well, right? I mean, you could, you could clip out, uh, I mean, you see, so you could still use the 40 by 40 thou square stock and the 20 thou for railings and it looks pretty good, you know, and it would sit on there really nice, see. But I'm not going to, uh, I want to build further spacing and use 25 thou. So, what I'm going to do is, is, is in the same way that I drilled out these rails on the ladders, um, I'm going to use the same drill bit, okay? And like I say, I don't go by the numbers, I just eyeball it. I drill it first and try and see if it actually does fit. Sometimes it'll be a little tiny bit loose or too tight, but you know, you just grab the next drill bit. That's the way I do it. Now, in this case, this 25 thou will not fit through that hole, obviously. It's not going to go, but it's going to go through the uh, following size just fine, see? So the original hole is just a pilot hole then. So what I do is I just chase the uh, original pilot hole that I used for the ladder. I just squeeze it in my finger and just gently rotate the next size drill bit up just to enlarge the hole a bit, see? This seems tedious, but it doesn't take very long. And once you get into the groove, like the first you'll be a little off center, like you'll muck a few up. But once you get into a rhythm, like everybody is intimidated to do these kind of things. I was, but I said, I'm gonna go for it anyway. So it actually turned out really good. I didn't waste a whole lot. Like the first one I did was a bit off here and there, but after doing a couple of strips, almost every one of them came out perfect. Okay, so these railings are going to be half inch high, which is about 45 inch HO scale. So they're, you know, uh, meet the standard for safety rail, especially up on a high tower like this. And so that works out to about half inch long. So I cut these little 25 thou rods by 5 eighths, just always a little extra, right? And now that I got them pushed into the rail and then glued just here, here, and here, and then I nipped off each end, right, with my nippers. Clean. Now I want to line up this rail to this one. So I'm just going to use this little ruler here, which is approximately 3 16ths, which is a good compromise for the center of the rail. And I'll just lay it on here like this. Okay. And then I'll just 
push this rail up tight against it like this. Okay, there's your railing. Okay, so you can see how I'm sliding the ladder over top of this 25 thou rods. So I laid the ladder on there and, and marked that center line on the column and, and drilled for three hard point 25 thou posts, right? But I drilled the holes in the ladder first and then I drilled down through the ladder just to line up the holes. I just taped the ladder on there little piece of tape, hold it in place, and did the same onto these braces here, see? So that when the ladder's mounted, it looks like that. See, this is what I mean, like this, like this is HO scale, but this is an unusually wide ladder that was on the prototype. Why that is, I'm not really sure, but probably for safety reasons, right? Because the kiosk that goes up and down. Uh, has a probably there's a minimum code for width. On the uh, f door frame opening to access this ladder. So why would they have a narrow ladder and a wide door frame so you could fall through? I think that's the reason why. See, so the ladders are very important. That's why I didn't go with. Um, let me just show you. Like these are nice little ladders too, you know, but they do say 1100 scale, not 187. So I'll show you the difference now, okay? Like these are still pretty good ladders, right, for HO, see? But notice how the rungs are smaller diameter too on the ones I scratched up. See? I mean, that would have worked, but I'm not going to go this far and then not you know, do that ladder properly. It just would look odd with the door frame on the kiosk, which is approximately the width of that ladder. So now you see the reason for my madness, right? Okay. So this slides down. So I slide this down. It's a snug fit, but I'll do it uh, very carefully here. So I slide this down like that. Just work it down slow and then I, I line up the holes on the other side of the ladder here and then I just slide it right down. I use a spacer. In this case I used, I just pushed it down, pushed it down. I used a spacer like this underneath and then put a dab of glue on it. And then I line up this top, like the ladder rail. See, remember how I talked about uh, building stuff with overrun? Okay, and then you save all your scrap for a gondola load later and you'll have a really unique diversified scrap load because all the different offcuts that you wouldn't have to methodically think through in one sitting, right? You end up with, uh, here I'll just point the camera to, to it. See over there? This is all going to get dyed dark black rust color for a nice gondola load for scrap metal, see? So nothing, nothing is wasted, as they say. But pretty happy with the, uh, uh, the way the ladders look. I'm glad I went to this um, 
Uh, I'm glad I, I took it this far because, you know, it uh, really makes a difference. See, so just get those lined up like that, see? And I work my ladder down. Just gently work it down. So I timed how long it took to drill out one of these rails, a full length rail, it's like 10 to 15 minutes. So but it sure is worth the trouble because these towers are really starting to look good. Okay. Here's a bunch more railings for the, for the barge pile and pads for the top of this. The one that stands away from the ramp, it's got a ladder on the back and some railings and some cranes on the front. So I just made up a whole bunch of little sections because they're made up of sort of two pair on each side. Like this one here, uh, you know, it's like this is what's going to happen. And this is why I stress to make extras all the time. Like by the time I push this one together. It's not that straight, right? But it's okay. Um, grab the next one. So just glue these two ends and leave this loose, right? See? Okay. Lay that in there. That one's a bit better. Before you know it, you got your fine scale railings. Um, I just want to talk to you for a second about building ladders and doing railings, which is really one and the same. Um, you know, the technique, you know, you build ladders or railings, it's the same. Using 40 by 40 thou and then 25 thou rod, pretty much for all the work on this particular project. Um, you can see in this case, I just pre-drilled already six holes on this ladder for the mounting points. And then I just used the ladder as a template, tape it down, and then I'm just gonna slide these and just to make sure they line up and then I'll just take them off and I'll just glue these pins in and then slide the ladder over top right but you know I just want to mention that for those who say oh geez that looks really painful to make ladders like that you know every modeler or anyone any model maker model builder model railroad if it if they have one spark or desire to model that means that you have the same brain as any other modeler right and in fact you don't even need to be a modeler like like the brain has a plasticity to it like we know that through science and biology that you can train the muscle memory of a brain like a brain is an incredible thing like when you start doing like ladders like this like when you start to drill out these holes for the rungs on the ladder like at first you're gonna mess up but then it doesn't take very long like um, I mean for me I was out of it for a bit but I just got back in the groove really quick but anybody can learn to do it because it's just muscle memory that's all it is it's the same way of, of for somebody when they first try to fly a radio control airplane they crash it because they can't coordinate their mind and their thumbs with the model in the air but before long they're flying to and fro back and forth and they don't even think about it, right? That's muscle memory. And muscle memory applies to model making as well. And when you're drilling small holes and you have very low tolerances, it's just a matter of just doing it 
And then the brain is incredible, the way the brain and the eye-hand coordination all starts to come together. Uh, you just have to go for it, you know. And uh, yes, larger scale is easier, but, um, you know, HO is not that much more difficult. I like to say when you get into it, you'll really surprise yourself, right? If you just, like the confidence will just build as you make mistakes. So make mistakes until you find the zone. And remember, plasticity of the brain takes over and forms the muscle memory. Before you know it, you're well on your way. Okay, I just want to take a moment to answer or address a few questions. One went way, way back uh, in earlier content, and one was just recent. Uh, okay, so the first one was where somebody had mentioned, oh, what do I need a center finding rule for? I can just draw an X in the square or a circle or whatever and find the center that way. Yes, you can, but that's when everything's convenient, though. Like, as a model maker, when you want to find a center of an undulating object or a 3D structure, you can't draw no X over it. I mean, you can, like, for example, like this pad, like I can take a measurement here. I want to find the center of it. I can go, okay, that's one and three, ah, give or take uh, five eighths and maybe three thirty seconds. Not sure, really. Close. Or I can use the center finding rule. As you can see right here, there's the center finding right there where the number six is. And then I just rough it into the center and I, I go to the eight here and the four see and I just slide it back and forth till both till it's even on both ends I can split up my increments perfectly on both ends just slide it slide it slide it around and once it it's equal on both ends there's center and I just make a mark like that it's just a convenient tool to quickly find center on something it's not the be all end all but it's a nice ruler to have for those of you that like rulers, and I've got them all, and I love this ruler for model making. It has saved me time to find centers on things so often. I just love it, okay? Plus, it has all the increments, all the metrics. It's made in Japan by Shinwat, stainless hardened like all my rulers, and I just love the good old center finding rule. Okay, so um, I just wanted to point this out. You can buy these from Plastruct, ladder and cage, number 90431. And, you know, they're pretty good, actually. Uh, here, let me just show you, you know, what they look like. Um, so there's a cage, and then they come with two ladders. And uh, the ladder basically mounts onto the cage like that. I mean, these are pretty good, you know, but then again, they're sort of a generic, they say HO scale, but actually, you know, they say one, 100. So it's sort of a, you know, a universal, you know, scale within HO and possibly S, I guess, or along those lines. Now, these are pretty good, you know, uh, but then again, you can make these, right? And how I'm going to make them because I want to uh, build a little bit finer detailed one for this particular uh, pile and slab because it's sort of right there like featured on the layout so uh, I want to get the railings um, finer than this like in this case I'm going to use 30 thou rod okay which will make quite a difference and then um, I've elected to use 3H tube, okay, which is number 232 by Evergreen Plastics, number 232, 3H tube. So I think I already pointed this out, like, you know, where you put a backstop here like this and then just cut the tube in half so you can handle it better. And then take a very sharp pencil, square up the end. Remember how I showed that as well? You know, you square up the end like this with a sanding block turn it a little bit get it nice and square right and then stroke it down with a bit of you know 600 or whatever so it takes a pencil mark nice and then what I do is slide it up against the backstop and then I just hold a pencil to it 
and I just rotate it whatever you're comfortable with if you want to rotate it away from yourself or you know towards yourself you know whatever works good it just takes a little like a few to get into the groove again and that's really easily done you just take another th sanding stick and you just put it in your finger like that and you just rub it and you actually you can feel it you can actually feel it on your finger if you just practice that a bit like just cut a whole bunch and then you know I mean what do these cost right um, and then just rub it back and forth and you'll see like remember how I talked about muscle memory right and just a feel that you develop from practice and before you know it you, know, you end up with a nice consistent ring for width right and in this case I took these ones down a little bit more and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to glue a strip of 30 thou on the inside or you can put it on the outside just get one started and then build my cage that way the ladder cage it'll look a little more fine scale okay Okay, so here's the uh, ladder and cage that I scratched up for this. Now, normally, uh, this would work. See, this is the plastruct one, remember? This one right here. 90431H01100 scale. But we're dealing with 187 scale. Like, that's this is scale. Well, I mean, within the ratio of that I'm building, but it's it's... I would say it's closer than this one here on the left. Like this one, there's just too much going on. There's too much material there. Although if I was to build like uh, a big grain elevator with ladders everywhere, I'd probably maybe uh, economically time-wise, I would probably go with something like this. You know, and you can just attach them. But uh, you can see the difference in the detail. Even in the ladder. See the rungs on the ladder? So you're looking at fine scale and then, you know, sort of generic, what I call fat scale, but it's still acceptable and still good. So, but I just that this model here, I just wanted to build it up like this because it has a little more delicate look to it. And it's only one, a one off sort of, and it just, uh, you know, seems to fit better and match more closely to the prototype. Okay, so uh, just to wrap up this tower episode, um, I want to show you how I build these lamp standards, okay? And then they'll be the same way I build these is the way I'm going to build the ones along the approach and the ramp. So there's three on each side, and then there's two on each tower like this. So this is brass stock here, and then a, a plastic collar that I'll show you how I build. So is that this can basically just slide out, see? And then the wire, you can see the wire goes down through. You can run it down through this column here too. I drilled the top. The hole goes all the way through. So you can run the wires down through the bottom here. And uh, down through the surface of the uh, layout. And then there's the LED on the end. And I'll be building the uh, the lamp bezels. will just be square, which I'll build out of this I-beam stock here. I'll show you that as well. And what I use for this is this K&S here. This is the smallest I could find. Well, it's not the smallest thin wall, 
brass uh, material, but it's the smallest square stock, and it's one sixteenth hollow, right? And it's stock number eight one four nine by K and S Precision Metals, which is another kiosk that every hobby shop should have, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, and that's what I'm going to use for the lamp standards on the whole ramp and barge slip, okay, because they just look really good, and I can run uh, basically LED wires, like these wires I can run through, I get these really small LEDs, I really like these, I get them from uh, Motown Models, he has a YouTube channel called Motown Models, Tom's really good over there, and he'll package these up for you, and even put lenses on them for you if you want, um, so... Anyway, they slide down in there. If I can see them. Yeah, there they go. Okay. Okay, and then the bezel will be plastic and the base is plastic. Like right here, and I'll show you how I make those. Okay, so what I use for the lamp standard bases or and collars are these three products right here. Number 103 10 thou by 60 which I just use for a shim. Okay. I use this here just to shim the inside of the square tube so it's a more snug fit with the brass square tube. Then I use this square tube number 252 which is 1 8th and then this quarter round number 248. Okay. So those are the three I use. Number 103, number 252, number 248. So because this um, square stock is normally just a bit too loose for this brass tube, see? I mean, it's not bad if you were, had a long collar, uh, but there's a little bit of play there. And so since it's going to be a short collar like this, I want it to be a little more snug. So what I do with these is, is I just take a piece of 60 thou, right? And I just stab the inside with a brush with some cement, cut them short, and then just run a piece of the 60 thou inside the tube and just press it down and shove it in with your knife like that. Right? And if it's wet enough and there was some solvent, then it'll pack it out a bit so that it looks a little bit like this one here. You can see the 60 thou in there. So now when I go to put this uh, brass square tube in, it's a nice snug fit, you know. It goes down in there nice. And uh, this gets glued to the base of the tower. It just sits like that. Of course, I'm going to trim it up so it looks like this one here. And this is the quarter round, right? Like, see how I glue the quarter round on there? Just oversize, right? Just flush. I just push them up against my uh, backstop here again, my gluing jig, right? And then what I'm going to do with these is I'm just going to trim them up. And then just uh, nail file them up so that you get a nice little lamp standard like that. See the profile the quarter round gives you? And then these slide in just like that. Okay. That way you can pop them off and change the lights. Um, so this one's already glued and mounted. So you see it goes in here like this. And there you go. Okay, so for the lamp bezel or shade or hood or whatever you want to call it, you can make any any shade you want. You just use your imagination with what whatever material you have. Like in this case, I just thought, well, I'll just use a piece of I-beam, number 276, 4.8 millimeters wide or, or whatever. And you can see I just cut a bunch of little short pieces like that. And I just drilled a hole in one end. A little bit smaller than this square tube and these are filed you know like a little bit you know they're rounded off a bit 
and if you dr drill a hole not too small you can just force this square through the hole right gently and if you drill the hole in a little bit of an angle that's how you get that angle like that and then it'll just hold itself in there see if the hole's too small it'll tend to split this but you know like even that's acceptable i mean it can be a, ha have a funny shape like that you know it's a anything goes in this game anything okay and so you can just dress that end with the piece of strip right glue it cut it off later and that's how i made these and i left them open on the top to run the wire until i figure out ah, maybe i'll put something over top but i'm not worried right so it's not important so it just gets deleted for now so and then there i have my basically lamp standards Okay, so I just want to talk to you in closing about the windsock. I almost forgot. So there's a flagpole I haven't put on here yet that's a little bit taller than this lamp standard pole. And it's on the, well, I guess if you're approaching it, it would be the uh, starboard side of the ramp or the river side. Now what I've done is I took a piece of uh, square thick plastic here that I had a piece of scrap. You could probably do this with wood uh, as well, and I'll tell you why, because you won't need glue at first. So what I did was, is I just carved this with a knife, you know, just carved a taper, right? And then I took a lighter, and I just heated it up over top of the layer, and I just put a bend in it like that. Just bend it so there's a, just to simulate a little bit of weight. Just picture that as a windsock. And then just take some toilet paper like peel the plies apart if it's two or three ply or four ply and then just wet this just dip it in water and then lay the toilet paper on in like little pieces and just brush it on okay just just with water you notice how if you take a piece of toilet paper wet and you throw it against the wall you come back the next day and it's almost hard as a rock right without any glue because it's the pulp right once it gets wet it reactivates and then it hardens into a real type like a type of glue almost so this was only a couple hours I just went away for a bit and came back and look how it slides off see it's a nice little wind sock right and then I'll just attach a little piece of uh, wire to it you know and paint it orange you know it's just a little wind sock when the tug you know like approaches right the wind sock moves around and they know when they're approaching the barge slip what's going on right cool huh? now what I'll do is because this is kind of fragile but it'll still work like that is I'll just take some matte medium now and I'll just brush on some matte medium and then just slide that off just lay it on a piece of wax paper or parchment and it'll harden it. It'll make it really hard so it becomes like a model part. And then you, it's got kind of a texture like a cloth to it. So when you paint it, it'll look really cool and you can put a wash on it and stuff. And it'll be nice and hard for you and you can trim it up. And, and if you mess it up, just make another one. Okay, so here's the finished windsock. Just needs to be painted now. You can see it's just toilet paper. Remember the mold I made out of plastic? So just toilet paper. Wet it down with a brush. When it dries, just slide the whole sleeve off. There'll be a lot of excess on there that I trimmed off. And then just slip it back on very lightly and just touch it quick with some matte medium, thinned matte medium, and then slide it off gently. Very light coat of matte medium. Just be gentle with it. It'll get harder and harder with each subsequent coat, coat of uh, matte medium. And then I use a little piece of wire, a piece of electrical wire. In this case, it's a little piece of stainless wire I had. And then drill the hole in the top of this dowel, and there it is. Little windsock for the top of the uh, barge ramp tower.